If you've got a Bible and you would like to turn with me to Psalm 63, that's our psalm this week. Uh, we are still in our series on Psalms, but I'm wrapping up our series within a series on the ABCs of intimacy. If you haven't been here the last couple of weeks, you probably need to go back and watch those because they'll give you context to today's message. And today's message is going to stretch some of us. Some of you, I, I honestly think Thursday night I saw uh, a family kind of almost kind of storm out because I, I just think it stretches. It's not a bad message at all. But he, here's the deal. If you, if you have a problem with intimacy with God, this is going to stretch you. This is going to stretch you. And here's what I would say. The enemy would love to try and beat you up and get you to beat you up that you don't have an intimate relationship with God like so-and-so. That's not what this message is about. Here's what this message is about. Right there. You catch that? See how deep this message is? Right here. One step. Just taking one step closer to the God of the universe. The ABCs, A was absolute sovereignty. And for those of you who, who kind of go, this, Preston, today's message, by the time you get to the end of it, some of you are going to think, this message was just excessive. Here's what I would say. No, it's not. It's extravagant. A big difference. Big difference. And, and by the way, and we're reading Psalms from David, David, when his own wife said, hey, bro, this is excessive. What you are doing for God right now is excessive. And he goes, <laughs> If you think this is excessive, oh, I got way more gears than this. I will be even more undignified than this. Here's what we know about love. Love isn't always pretty, but it's always beautiful. If you watch the way I love my, my wife, some of you will be like, that's embarrassing. Not to her, it's not. Not to me, it's not. Love might not always be pretty, but it's always beautiful. Started with A, absolute sovereignty, so that we make sure that even as intimate as we become with the God of the universe, he always in our hearts remains the God enthroned above it all, the King of Kings, the God of the universe, okay? Last week we talked about breathtakingly bankable love. That was God's love for you. My favorite subject on the planet, God's love for you, God's love for me. This weekend though is our response. So remember, we did this in order on purpose because you didn't love God first. He loved you first. That's 1 John 4, 19. We love him because he first loved us. You didn't pick him. He picked you. He chose you before you ever even had a thought about him. This weekend, we're going to talk about your response to God's love for you. Another way to say it, your love for God in light of his love for you. And the title of the message is Creative Pursuit. Creative Pursuit. Now, I'm calling it this because years ago, the Lord gave me a definition for the word romance. And, and it's this, the art of unpredictable pursuit. It's one of our values as a church, romance. Just another way to say intimacy. It's not weird, it's scriptural. At the end of King David's life, the piece of advice he gave his son Solomon, think about this, Solomon's gonna become the king. David was the richest man ever, the best king Israel had ever had. There were a lot of things David could have imparted to his son. And here's what he imparted to his son Solomon. Son, get to know the God of your forefathers intimately. Son, the key to my life, I got to know the God of the universe intimately. Lot to think about for some of us. We got to seriously run through eight points, okay? So we got to keep it tight. But let me just give you a phrase before we get into the first point that I think will blow your mind. Now, I'm going to give it to you incomplete because I'm going to give you the rest of the phrase in point number one. But I want you just to, to meditate in your heart on this phrase. The God of the universe created you. Why? Why did the God of the universe create you? Was it just to accomplish something? Because I, I would submit to you, he could have gotten anybody else to accomplish what you accomplish. So that can't be it. The God of the universe created you. Why? Here's what I believe the answer to be. God created you so that he could love you. He created you because he wanted to love you. Think about this. He didn't have to. But he did. Why? Because he wanted to love you. 
Now there's more to this phrase, but I just want you to let that just start to set in, sink into your heart. God created me so that he could love me. Here's one of the things we all understand about love, that love involves learning how to love the one you love the way they long to be loved. This episode of Sesame Street was brought to you by the letter L. I learned this when I first got married. I thought the way to love my wife was to love her the way I wanted to be loved. And can anybody holla at your boy who has learned it doesn't work like that? Like it didn't work. I loved her the way I wanted to be loved. What I learned was I needed to study the girl. I needed to study the one I was in love with and am in love with so that I could learn how she longs to be loved. I think God's the same way. I think there are ways that God desires to, for us to love him. There are things he loves for you to do when you show your love for him. And I think Psalm 63, David, this is a little bit of a, a list. David had figured out some of God's favorite ways to be loved by him. And so we're going to go through eight of them. This is certainly not exhaustive, but we're just going to use Psalm 63 as our text to kind of give us some ideas. Because if you feel your relationship with God's a little stale, you will have no excuse after David gives you this list. All right. And the way that I, I kind of worded these points is from God's perspective to you. Okay. Almost as if you asked him the question, God, how do you long for me to love you? Would you give me a list, Lord? How do you long for me to love you? I think this would be some of his response. Here's point number one. I think he would say, love me like you mean it. Don't just tell me you love me. Love me like you actually mean it. Psalm 63, verse 1. And there are eight points because we're going to go through the first eight verses of, of Psalm 63. Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search after you. My soul, it thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land called earth where there is no water. This is pretty extravagant. Can we agree on that? Like some of us are like, I've never talked to the Lord like that in my life. Here's what you need to know. He loves it when you do. God, I long for you. I thirst for you. I really, 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 really want you. Let me give you the other half of the phrase. First half of the phrase, God created you to love you. Here's the other half of the phrase. God created you to love you and to be loved by you. God created you because he wanted you to love him back. Wrap your mind around the God of the universe created me because he wanted to be loved by me. What the what? What? He doesn't need anything. Yet he wanted to be loved by me. He wanted to be loved by you. Well, Preston, I, you don't know me. I'm not this. I'm not that. I don't think that's how he's talking about you. He created you to be loved by you. The best response to the love of God is just to love him back. Think about it. Jesus was asked, what's the most important commandment in the entire Bible? And let me give you a paraphrase, my perspective of this. A man says to Jesus, tell me about your father. What's the top of his list? Like, what does he want? What, what, what's the number one thing? And Jesus kind of went like this. <laughs> I'll tell you right now. The number one thing my father wants, he wants you to love him with all of your heart, all of your soul, all your mind, all your strength. That was Jesus' answer. Some of us walk around like the, the answer would be, he, he wants me to do every command. He wants me to be perfect. He wants me to give all of my money to the church. He wants me to do this. Jesus said, you want to know what's at the top of my father's list? 
He just wants you to love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He created you to be loved by you. Number one, love me like you mean it. Number two, meet me like you love it. Keep going in verse two. I have seen you in your sanctuary. Notice David didn't say, in my master bedroom watching online. <laughs> Not trying to throw shots at anybody. I'm just telling you, some of our habits, we, we, we got out of habit. I, listen, this might shock you. It doesn't matter to me if you go to this church. I want you to go to the church, capital C. I want you to be in a church where God's presence is and they teach God's word unapologetically. That's my desire. People will come and go here. It's not about attendance. Because some of y'all pessimists are like, Preston just wants more attendance. Really? You know there are a lot of other ways I can do that? I'm not, I'm not about that. I'm telling you this because I think it's one of God's favorite things. Let me say it another way. One of God's favorite places to be with you is in his house. Absolutely, positively, one of his favorite places to be with you is in his house. But some of us kind of have this perspective of going to church. I'll go when I feel like it. Okay, let me just tell you, that's not how love talks. If I only did things for my kids when I felt like it, we'd have a very different relationship. <laughs> Daddy, I'm done. I don't feel like wiping somebody's hiney right now. I, I, I go when I feel like, well, I just don't feel like it today. I don't think that's how love talks. Especially when you get a revelation that one of God's favorite places to be with you is in his house. We, we burst through the wall of I don't feel like it and we get a glimpse of how excited he is to meet with us in his house. Psalm 122, verse 1. David says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Here's a great question for you. Are you as excited to meet with him in his house as he is excited to meet with you in his house? The God of the universe. Get a picture, and I'm going to over-dramatize this a little bit. Can you imagine the God of the universe every weekend of your life being like this? Ooh, I can't wait for them to come into my house. And I'm being a little bit silly just to, to, to kind of prove a point. Some of us just think he's like, you better get into my house. You better get there. You better show up. Don't you not show up? And I'm like, I don't think that's how he's talking every weekend of your life. Can't wait for you to show up. I've been there all night just preparing the room for you. Some of us just, this is how we see going to church, church attendance. I hate that phrase, church attendance. Church attendance is a box to check. In the same way that when I was in school, school attendance was a box to check. And I would check the box, but that didn't mean I was present. The teacher would check the box, but that didn't mean I was taking notes. The principal We'll make sure the boxes were checked, but that didn't mean I was listening to all my teachers. If attendance is the goal, is that what date days are like with your spouse? I'm just going to show up, but I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not really going to talk to you, but I'm here. I think if you ask the Lord, what's one of your favorite ways for me to love you? I think he would say, I love it when you meet me at my house and bring all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength to be with me in one of my favorite places to be with you. Here's point number three. If you ask the Lord, what's your favorite way to be loved by me? I think he would say, praise me because you get me. Praise me because you get me. Verse three, your chesed, if you weren't here last week, you can go back and learn a Hebrew word. Your chesed, your unfailing love, O oh God, is better than life itself, how I praise you. Interestingly enough, it's intriguing to me that a lot of times in the Psalms and throughout Scripture, thanks and praise are lumped together. Think about Psalm 100, verses 4 and 5. Go in through the gate with thanksgiving, but you want to go into the private, private space? 
go in with praise. Go through the gate with thanksgiving, go through into the inner place with praise. A lot of times they're connected together, but David in Psalm 63 doesn't connect thanks with praise. I wonder if it's not because it's easier for many of us to thank someone for what they've done for us than it is to communicate to them what they mean to us and who they are to us. It's easier to say, thank you for doing that for me, instead of saying, baby, I love you. I'm going to tell you nine different ways I love you. And I'm going to tell you 12 different ways you mean the world to me. So this is what praise is. Praise is just finding a new way to tell him you love him and why. I learned this as a dad when, when I did the first seven-day survival guide talking about my needs. I, I learned emotionally what I need is at least once a week someone in my house to stop me, hold me, say I love you, and give me one reason why. I don't know why it works like this for me, but when someone I love tells me they love me and why, my emotional tank overflows. It explodes. I think God says to us, Preston, I love it when you say I love you. You know what I love even more? When you tell me new whys. That's what praise is. And let me, let me show you something that's incredible. I'm gonna read it out of the King James Version. Psalm 22, verse three. three. But thou art holy, O thou, this is speaking of God, that inhabitest, when was the last time you used that word, inhabitest the praises of Israel. Have you ever heard about somebody having a favorite chair in their house? You ever heard that? Oh, my, my husband, my, my child has a favorite chair in the house. You know, it's kind of what Psalm 22, 3 is saying. That God has a favorite chair. You know what it is? Your praise. This is why when I start my alone time with him, with praise, Father, I love you. And here's seven reasons why I love you. And three of them I've never told you before. Here's what happens every time I do something like that. I feel like the God of the universe shows up so present, it's like he sits down in a chair in front of me and just looks at my face. Hey, buddy, it's good to see you. Thanks for pulling up my favorite chair in all the earth. I know he sits on the throne. I'm talking about his manifest presence. He sits, he inhabits the praise that comes from my heart, that comes from your heart. One of the best ways to start your alone time with God is just to pull up his favorite chair. It's praise. God, you are unbelievable. Here are four reasons why I think you're so unbelievable. Now, some of us might think, Preston, that sounds a lot like flattery. No, 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 there's a huge difference between flattery and praise. Flattery uses kissing up to get favor. Praise uses lifting up to get presence. Because he says, when you praise, Preston, I just pull up a chair right there. Right there. How's my guy doing? How you been? I love it when you talk to me like this. Praise. I feel so distant, Preston, when I try and have time alone with the Lord. I just praise him. Just start telling him all the reasons why you love him. Shout it from the rooftop and see how he responds. Here's point number four. Commit yourself to me like you'll never get enough of me. Don't just say, Preston, you're, you'll commit yourself to me. Commit yourself to me like you will never, ever, ever be able to get enough of me. Verse four. I will praise you as long as I live. Lifting up my hands to you in prayer. I honestly think one of God's favorite phrases to hear us say is not just I love you, but I think he kind of giggles when we say, God, I love you and I am never going to stop. God, I can't wait to spend eternity with you so I can prove I'm the most annoying lover of yours who will ever live. I'm just gonna follow you around and tell you I love you all the time. I love you. I love you. I don't wanna go too far down this road, but some of us don't even use that phrase very much. If you don't use the words I love you very often, I'm gonna very gently submit something to you for your consideration and prayer. 
Why don't you use that phrase? Is it because you didn't hear it enough? I don't know. I don't know what your why is. But three of my favorite words in any language are I love you. And you want to know why? Because for some reason, when you use that phrase, it hits people some kind of way. And that includes God. You want, a, you want a fun little piece of homework for the next seven days? See how many times you can tell the God of the universe that you love him. Just try it for seven days. Especially if you feel like you're hitting a wall in your relationship with the Lord. Just try it for seven days. See how many times you can tell him you love him and give him a reason why. When we get married and, and we see commitment like this, we see it as legal. Well, I, I'll, I promise never to leave you or forsake you. And here's the problem. There's, there's kind of an inference in many marriages, in many hearts, and, and here's the kind of hidden, implied inference. I'll love you until I'm done with you. Because I kind of see you like my favorite restaurant. You'll be my favorite restaurant until you're not. Well, that's not commitment. It's kind of what scared me a little bit going through COVID. I saw people I never, ever imagined would walk away from the Lord, and they did. What's your measure of commitment? Is it fair weather? Or are you like a good Cowboys fan who will endure misery for decades? <laughs> I remain committed. I also don't have a quarterback who has to be paid to do homework during the week, but that's a whole nother. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. What's your measure of commitment? I think he loves it when you say things like, I love you and I am never, ever, 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 ever gonna stop. My goal in life and for eternity is to learn how to love you, God, more and more every day of my life. I don't commit to you because I think it's the right thing to do. I commit myself to you because I just can't get enough of you. This is why David says, I will praise you, not when things are good, not just because things are bad and I need you to move or act. I will praise you no matter what, as long as I live. There's one point in scripture when David thought he was dying and he said to the Lord, how can I praise you from the grave? <laughs> How can I tell you I love you and tell all these people how much I love you from the grave? And I just think God was like, you got me again. Okay. This guy was obsessed with his God. I I've called Psalm 63 probably for over 10 years the psalm I'm trying to live up to. This is my goal, to have this kind of intimate fellowship with the God of the universe. Here's the fifth thing. Prioritize me like you actually believe nothing can compare to me. Did you know the God of the universe wants to be your number one priority as though nothing else in your eyes or heart or mind could ever compare to him? Verse five, David says, you satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. I don't have time to hang out here for too long, but here's the picture I got this week as I was studying this out. It was like I saw little boy Preston in the palace of King David at the biggest feast of the decade. And there's all this incredible stuff going on and the food is just off the hook. And the little boy is just looking around going, this is incredible. The best meat, the best this, the best that, the best that. This is, a, I've never seen food like this in my life. This is the richest feast ever. Here's the picture I got. It was like King David looked over and saw little boy Preston being enamored with all of the food and the feast. And he looked at God and said, Lord, little boys like that think the best part about being me is all of this. But I want you to know the best part of being me is you satisfy me more than any of this stuff ever will. What's commandment number one? 
Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Preston, don't put anything on my level in your heart. Because I love it when you prioritize me. H have you ever had a plan and then you felt the Lord hijack it and, and kind of lead you this way, but he was leaving it up to you? Can I give you another way to see that the next time you get into that situation? He's standing there going, you know what I would love? I would love it if you would not go this way and go this way for me. See it as the opportunity of a lifetime to give the God of the universe something that will make him giggle, not just grin. Don't see it as some annoyance. See it as the opportunity of a lifetime. He loves to be prioritized. Doesn't everyone? How does my wife feel when I prioritize my job over my bride? This isn't my bride. This is Jesus' bride. How does my wife feel when I prioritize Christ's bride over Preston's bride? Well, it hurts a little bit, doesn't it? And it's also confusing because I told her I would prioritize her above everyone else, above everything else except for God. Everyone loves to be prioritized, God included. That's why the first of the Ten Commandments is, hey, hey, don't let anything compete with me in your heart. Put me first. Prioritize me because I love it when you do. Here's point number six. Think about me like you're obsessed with me. I think if you ask the God of the universe, how do you long to be loved by me? I think he would absolutely say, I want you to think about me like you're obsessed with me. Keep going. Verse six. David says, I lie awake thinking of you. He daydreams about God all day. I lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night. Day and night, I'm thinking about you. Can't get you off of my mind, God. I just keep thinking about you over and over and over again. Don't we all kind of spend more and more time thinking about whatever we love to the extent that we love it? Just take hobbies, for example. Uh, those closest to me would say that I uh, maybe have a little bit of an obsessive personality when it comes to the things that I love. If there's a hobby, I don't want to just have the hobby. I want to learn everything I can learn about it. Have you ever seen God like that? How much time do you spend on a day-to-day -day basis actually thinking about him like one who loves him? How many of your thoughts, what percentage of your thoughts throughout the day are only about him? David says, I lie awake thinking about you and I meditate on you through the night. You know what that, that word meditate literally means? To mumble under your breath. David would lay in bed just going, I love you so much, I can't even live without you. I can't even fall asleep right now, but I promise you, you're the greatest thing that's ever happened to me in my life. You know, his wife was laying in the bed like, bro, Either speak up or shut up. <laughs> David's like, I love you so much. Seriously, I can't live without you. <laughs> I meditate on you all night long. When was the last time? For those of you who are married, you were awakened in the middle of the night by your spouse because you were talking in your sleep about the God of the universe. Preston, I didn't even know that was a possibility. Well, the more of my mind... He occupies. The more of my heart he occupies, the more it's going to come out of my mouth all the time. Here's another way to say it. The more you think about him, the more your mouth can't help but talk about him. And the more you talk about him, the more your mind can't help but think about him. It's just a wonderful circle. I think about you. I can't help but talk about you. The more I talk about you, I can't help but think even more about you. Press and think about me like you're obsessed with me. God says in Psalm 139, David, God speaks this through David and David says, God, your thoughts about me are overwhelming. I can't even number them. Now, if that were incorrect, God wouldn't have allowed it in scripture. God would have gone, no, that's actually untrue. You can actually number my thoughts about you. But God didn't correct him. God didn't pull it out of scripture. 
So God agreed with David saying, you're exactly right. My thoughts for you cannot be enumerated. What if God asked you, how about your thoughts about me? Is it twice a day? Is it 200 times a day? When people read the verse, pray without ceasing, some people get overwhelmed by it. You want to know what makes praying easy? Thinking about God. If you spend an hour thinking about God, I assure you, you're going to spend some time talking about God. But the less I think about God, the less I'm going to talk to God, not just about God. But did you know, one of his favorite ways to be loved by you is for you to think about him like one who is obsessed with him. Here's point number seven, and this one's going to stretch some people. Two more and we're done. Number seven, get ready for the stretch. If you ask the God of the universe, what's one of your favorite ways to be loved by me? Here's what I think he would say. Sing to me just because you know I love it. And some of y'all are like, oh, sorry, Preston, draw the line there. I don't sing. And trust me, I'm doing the church a favor because if you heard my voice, you would tell me to be quiet. It doesn't matter how good your voice is. Let me show you verse seven. Because you are my helper, I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. I could read you a ton of verses, but David went on record in other Psalms and said, God gave me a new song. He put a new song in my mouth. Why would God give David a new song? Because he loves hearing him sing them. Here would be the million dollar question. Did David sing because his voice was good? I can't think of anywhere in scripture that said David had an amazing voice. I don't think he sang because his voice was awesome. He played the harp. And was the last time you saw somebody singing when they were being accompanied by a harp? Yet, listen, the book of Psalms, for those of us who are like, I don't think God cares about my song. The longest book in the Bible, 150 chapters. Psalms were written to be sung. Half of them are written by David. That means he loved writing songs. Why? I think it's because he got a revelation of just how much his heavenly father loved his singing. He put a new song in my mouth. I remember when I had a literal breakthrough in my alone time with the Lord. It was one tweak that I made because Pastor Robert, my mentor, coached me to make this tweak in my alone time. Before, before I made the tweak, it was hard for me to get to 30 minutes. It, it, I felt like proud if I could just get to 30 minutes. And then he coached me up a little bit and he said, Preston, you know what? You know what your time alone with the Lord means? You need to lead yourself in worship before the Lord, for the Lord. Lead yourself in worship before the Lord, for the Lord. And I remember the first time I did it. I, I don't even remember how long it went because I didn't even look at the clock. It just went and went. Because I could feel in my heart, something is going on in his heart when I lift up this song to him and him alone. I remember back here one day, about a year and a half ago, uh, I grew up, my dad was a worship pastor, an incredible worshiper. He would sit outside my bedroom door and play his piano on Saturday morning, some Saturdays for hours. And the presence of the Lord would just fill our home. That's how I grew up. And I was back here and I, I felt the Lord say one day, I was just singing to him and I felt him say, Preston, I want you to learn how to play the piano. Not so that anyone will ever see it, but just so I can receive it, him. And then he said this, and this was a bomb. He goes, Preston, I'm gonna make you a promise. Every new song you learn to sing for me, I'm going to use as a key to unlock the door of a new room in our relationship where I show you a side of me I've never shown you before. Homie, I got on YouTube and started learning fast. I texted Cody and said, I'm trying to learn how to play the piano, hook a brother up. Simply because God said, Preston, you know one of my favorite things? I love it when you sing to me. When we sing together at the beginning of a service, is it just something we do corporately? 
Or is it like Christmas in our hearts where we give him a song we've never sung to him before? Some of you are like, Preston, I'm telling you, my voice is awful. So was your coloring in kindergarten, but your mom still loved your pictures. Let's put it up on the refrigerator. Can I just remind you, your coloring was awful in kindergarten. You never stay between the lines and you always pick the wrong colors. You colored human beings purple. Yet, it hit someone you love in a way because you were giving it to them where they made it seem like you were Michelangelo. Why? Because they loved you were giving something special to them. You got a bad voice? Don't fret. He might like your song even more because it makes you humble yourself. Because there's a part of you that can't stand to hear yourself. I think if you asked him, Lord, what's one of your favorite ways to be loved by me? I think he would say, I love it when you sing to me. So when you go to have your time alone with the Lord, just get on YouTube. This, I, I mean, I don't know how people did it before now. It's so easy now. And if you have trouble with playlists, or you, you know, email us. We'll send you some links. Just go in and have some worship. Don't go in and start off with a bunch of requests. What would it be like if you just went in once in a while and started off with a bunch of songs? While you were out here worshiping, I was holed up back there, singing at the top of my lungs in a six foot by nine foot closet. Why? I don't understand how it works. I just know he loves it when he gets my song. Here's the last point. Point number eight, my favorite one. If you ask the God of the universe, how do you long to be loved by me? I think he would say, chase me as though there was nowhere else you wanted to be except with me. Preston, I love it when you chase me. Here's verse eight. David says, I cling to you. Your strong right hand holds me securely. Why does God want us to chase? Is he hiding? Let me say it this way. I don't think God wants you to chase after him because he loves hiding from you. I think it's because he set things up in a very specific way because he loves to be found by you. God isn't hiding from you. He wants to be found by you. And he actually promises you in scripture that you will find him if you go after him. Jeremiah 29, verses 13 and 14. And you will seek me and find me, Preston, when you search for me with all of your heart. Watch this next part. Make no mistake, son. Make no mistake, daughter. I am not hiding myself from you so you'll never find me. I will be found by you. Why must we chase? Because we don't prize what we don't pursue but we do prize what we have to pursue. Holly made me chase her. That's why once I got her, I was never letting, let, never letting go of her. First time I tried to kiss that girl in college, she laughed and turned and I kissed her teeth. And I don't know why it worked like this, but I was like, I'm gonna marry you. I'm coming after you. We prize what we pursue. The world's caught up in the pursuit of happiness. But followers of Jesus understand the happiness of pursuit. Think about this. Two of the most important words in the Bible spoken by Jesus over a three-year period of time. And what were those words? He would just walk up to people and say, follow me. Do you know what, what that phrase means? Go after me. You know what the phrase chase means? Go after. Jesus said, here's how this is going to work. Come after me. Chase me. Press and turn your back on all that stuff and just chase me. The key to your life, son, will be found in your chase of me. Chase me, God says, as though there were nowhere else you wanted to be except with me. Here's how much he loves to be chased 
by you, Hebrews 11, 6, but without faith, it's impossible to please God for he who comes to God must believe this, that he is a rewarder of those who chase after him. You know what that means? Every time I chase him, he's promised to respond. What if we asked less and chased more? I think we, we might see it a little better response rate. Daddy, can you do this? Can you please do this? Can you please do this? Can you please do this? Yeah. Every once in a while, he says yes. But what if I stopped asking so much and I started chasing much more? Jesus said, here it is, Preston. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Here's what that looks like. Come chase. Come chase. The God of the universe will be found by you. Here's what we're going to do to finish this message together. We're going to live it out. So would you just bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment, and then we're going to put on the screen the eight points of the message. In the close of this message, as I try to think about what's the best close for this message, the only thing I could think of, which beat everything, every other option I could think about, was you choosing one of the eight things in Psalm 63 to give to the Lord before you leave his house today. So they're gonna, they're gonna put up uh, kind of one of my favorite background, uh, audio backgrounds in my time alone with the Lord. There's no words, so it won't be distracting. The reason I spend probably about 75 plus percent of my time with this kind of calibrating my secret place alone with the Lord is every time I hear this, it's like my brain has been conditioned to just go right in. And maybe you find something, maybe there's a worship song that takes you in like that. But I just want us to take a few moments right now, just forget about everything going on. Push everything that isn't him away. Breathe a little deeper. Open up your heart. Lay aside your frustrations. And let's commit to take a step closer in our hearts towards the God of the universe. On the screen are the eight points. And I want you just over the next couple of minutes, pick one, at least one of these and give it to the Lord for a few minutes. Don't feel like you just have to do it quietly in your heart. You can begin just quietly talking to the Lord right there in your seat. Maybe you feel the Holy Spirit say, I want a song right now. You might just sing quietly under your breath. Just write a new song in your heart to him. Maybe you've committed to some other things. Double down and recommit to him. Tearing down any other commitment that would compete with your commitment to him. Find 24 new ways to tell him you love him and why. Give him your praise. Pull up a chair for him. Maybe you just need to sit there and think about him. Like you're obsessed with him. Maybe you need to find 109 different ways with your voice to just say, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you, love you, love you. Take a step.
Holy Spirit, I come against any distraction in Jesus' name. I pray that minds and hearts would be focused. It's a lot to wrap our minds around. <laughs> that the God of the universe created each of us so that he could specifically and individually love us. But that wasn't his only why. God, it boggles the mind that you created us also to be loved by us. May our hearts soften. Just like the deluge of rain we got last night that has softened the soil. Lord, I pray that the living waters of your love would soften the soil of our hearts in such a way that there is no space within them you don't have access to. God, would you help each of us to take seriously one of the biggest reasons we've been created to love you. Show us new ways that you long to be loved by us with. In Jesus' name, amen.